Mr. Dyson here with Lesson 2 of Unit 11, Electric Current Resistance and DC Circuits. We start with the concept of resistance. Come, join the resistance. So resistance, it means resistance to the flow of charged particles, resistance to the flow of electrons through the wire. So as the electrons are moving through the wire, we've seen they, they bump into things, they zigzag around, they don't get, you know, they don't move real quick. But every, every material is different, every metal is different. And, and some metals, it's easier for the electrons to get through, and other metals, it's harder. And that's a measurement of the resistance to the flow of the charges. Now, so resistance is measured in volts per Amp. So the resistance is equal to the voltage divided by the current. And the thing about that is so, so it's volts per amp, right? In other words, voltage can be thought of as the pressure that's pushing the electrons through the wire, all right? And uh, of course, amps is the actual flow of the electrons. So resistance is a measure of how many volts it takes to get an amp to flow through the wire. Uh, so the higher the resistance is, the more voltage it takes to get the current to flow through the wire. That's the concept of resistance. Resistance is measured in a unit called the ohm. It's a little omega, Greek letter omega is used to uh, abbreviate ohm. And uh, as we just saw, resistance is equal to voltage divided by current, so an ohm is equal to one volt per amp. Um, and it, it, the idea is that, uh, as I just said, it arises due to the collisions between the electrons carrying the current with the fixed atoms that are inside the conductor that they keep bumping into. And here he is, the man himself, Georg Simon Ohm. 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 Sorry. Okay, so Ohm's Law, all right, here's what he did. He put these three letters together and everybody said he was a genius. He said that the voltage is equal to the current times the resistance. That's Ohm's Law. It's just a rehash of what we just said. Because if you think about this, it says the resistance is equal to the voltage divided by the current, right? The voltage is equal to the current times the resistance. The current is equal to the voltage divided by the resistance. There you go, there's all three forms of Ohm's law, depending on which thing you're looking for in a circuit. All right, so we've got the voltage, which is the push, uh, the pressure pushing the electrons through. You've got the current, which is the electrons flowing, the amperage. You've got the resistance, which is uh, the, the the wire itself trying to keep the electrons from moving through or impeding their process, getting in their way. All right, uh, an ohmic device is a device where the resistance stays the same no matter what voltage you put on it. So, you know, obviously, as you increase the voltage, you increase the current. So, you know, voltage, I don't know, let's put some numbers in here just to make up some numbers. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. All right, so let's say, you know, one volt uh, take, we'll, we'll push one amp through the wire. Two volts will push two amps through the wire. Three volts will push three amps through the wire. So you see that, that relationship's linear. And the slope of this line is one over R, or one over the resistance. That's something to bear in mind probably for like a, a free response question, because you remember how they love to do graphs and free response questions. So the slope, if you have the voltage this way and the current that way, the slope of the line tells you one over the resistance and so you could just flip that to find the resistance. But not every material reacts this way. Some materials actually change. Like if you increase the voltage, it makes the, the resistance get different. And it doesn't follow a linear pattern. So the same idea here, you know, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. You know, one volt might only get you up to three quarters of an amp. Two volts might you know, get you up here. And what's happening as it goes up, as you increase the voltage, it looks like the resistance is, you know, one over the resistance is changing. But the, you don't need to memorize this, but the, the point is simply that some materials are what we call ohmic, and they follow Ohm's law. All right, you get a straight line relationship when you, when you 
graph the voltage versus the current. You get a straight line relationship. That's an ohmic material. And a non-ohmic material, you do not get a straight line relationship when you graph the voltage uh, times the current. So in other words, changing the voltage actually changes the resistance of the material. And, you know, a common uh, substance or a common uh, circuit element that, that this uh, occurs with is the diode. You've probably heard of light emitting diodes. And we'll, uh, we'll look at some of those when we do our, um, our uh, lab for this unit. But in any event, there are things, and another one is, uh, you know, transistors, semiconductors. These are materials that are non-ohmic. Resistivity is, is a study of um, the resistance of different materials. So what, do the, what does the resistance of a material depend upon? So one thing it depends upon is the length. So if you have a real tiny short wire, right, that's, you know, going to have less resistance than a longer wire. Well, that makes sense just because, you know, it's got to go through more wire. Okay, so the length of the conductor increases means the resistance will increase. Um, and then, of course, the, the cross-sectional area. Let's say you have a little tiny wire like this. You know, its cross-sectional area is very tiny. And a very large wire like that where the cross-sectional area is very large. I mean, think of pipes. Think of water flowing through this pipe. It's a very small pipe. The water can't flow real fast. This is a much larger pipe. The water can get through it more easily. So the larger the cross-sectional area of the material, the smaller the resistance is going to be. And all of this is put together with this uh, letter here, which is called Rho, R-H-O. It's a Greek letter called Rho. And that's called the constant of proportionality. Uh, and it tells us about the resistivity of the material. And every different material has a different resistivity. And so, you know, they have a table where you can look them up. We're not going to be doing that. I'm not going to go through problems with this. But I just want you to see two things here. The longer the conductor is, the more resistance. And the larger the cross-sectional area of the conductor, the less resistance. Right? Those are two things, two facts you should know about resistance. Also, when a, res when a material is hotter, its resistance increases. Okay, now the reason for that <coughs> is that when a, when a material is hotter, the atoms inside are vibrating faster back and forth. <clears throat> and so they create a harder uh, environment for the electrons to pass through because now the atoms are moving faster up and down all around. So as an electron is trying to get through it, it's going to have a more be more likely to bump into them. So more temperature means higher resistivity for materials. <clears throat> All right, electrical energy. Now we're just going to think uh, about a charge as it moves through an electrical circuit. Okay, so uh, first of all, it, it gains its energy from some sort of a, of a, a potential energy source. Um, better off to see a picture here, uh, a circuit here. So a battery is usually the most common example of uh, a, a potential difference, and that's what creates the energy for the electrons to move around the circuit. So the, uh, the battery has what we talked about in the first lesson. It has a, a potential difference. In other words, it has a voltage. So that from the positive plate of the battery to the negative plate of the battery, there is a potential difference. And therefore, an electric field is set up through the wires. And that is what causes the electrons to move along. The higher the voltage, the more energy will be given to the electrons, and again, again that will allow for more current to flow. More electrons will be able to flow um, through the wire. But the idea here is, uh, if you, they say, let's follow a charge going from point A around and back to point A. So as it goes through the battery, it gains energy. The battery loses energy because the batteries are basically created with chemical reactions. So the chemical reaction occurs, and the battery loses energy by giving some of it to the electrons. So now the electrons got this energy and it's moving through. Now it comes up to a resistor. So it's got, you know, it's got uh, kinetic energy because that's, you know, any object that's moving has to have kinetic energy, even an electron, even an electron moving in a wire, even though it's microscopic, it's moving, it's got kinetic energy. It comes up to the resistor, starts to pass through it and bump into all those atoms. Well, what's going to happen? Every time it bumps, it's going to lose a little bit of that energy, lose a little bit of that energy. By the time it gets through, you know, it's lost all of that energy, and it comes back around here. And then it can go back through the battery and gain it back again, and, you know, so on and so forth, around and around. 
And of course, batteries don't last forever. Eventually, they give up all of the energy, the chemical energy that they have, and the battery goes dead. All right, the concept of power. Now we know that power, we've learned before, power is equal to joules per second. Joules per second, the amount of energy per second that's, that an uh, object has, uh, or that is given to an object. So it's the rate at which the energy is lost um, from the electron to the, say, the resistor. Let's go back to this picture. So again, we talk about the energy. Now, one thing that's going to happen is that the energy that the, the, the kinetic energy that the electron has as it goes through the resistor and bumps into the atoms, it gives that energy to the atoms. It loses that energy itself. But what's going to happen to those atoms as they get more energy? Well, they're going to start bouncing around even more. That creates heat. So when electrons pass through resistors, the resistors become warmer. They heat up. If you've ever seen one of those uh, uh, heaters that you buy in the store where the, uh, the filaments, the, the elements grow orange, uh, they glow, and that's an example of the electrons passing through uh, and the resistance <coughs> of the material, and they give their energy to it, and the material heats up, and, and some materials heat up so much that they start to glow. But that's the idea of power. So um, the formula that we use for power is power is equal to um, the current multiplied by the voltage. So that's a pretty straightforward formula for electric power. There's another version of that formula, and that's uh, power is equal to I squared R. I do not expect you to make this fancy P. You can make a regular P. Um, but uh, power is equal to I squared R, which is also equal to V squared over R. So you really have three formulas here for power. Power equals current times voltage, and power equals current squared times resistance, and power equals voltage squared divided by resistance. Right? These can all be derived by simply using Ohm's law and substitution. I'll, I'll probably do that for you in class. All right, so electrical energy and power then um, is measured in watts, and we've already we already know that from from learning about power in mechanical um, motion. So the watt is equal to a joule per second, and um, so when you're using energy in your home, electrical energy, right, you're using up watts. You'll, you'll see on all the devices you use, your microwave oven or, or your heater or whatever you plug in. If you look on it, it tells you how much power is utilized by the device. So it's telling you basically how many joules per second. You know, joules per second, that's a watt. So how much energy per second you're using. Now you get charged by the electric company for your energy. And you've probably heard of a kilowatt hour that's what you get charged for on your electric bill. And that's really not a measurement of power. It's a measurement of energy. And we know the difference between energy and power, right? So energy is joules, just uh, you know the, 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 the work being done, the joules. Joules per second, how many, how many joules you're getting per second, that's your power. That's watts. A kilowatt hour <clears throat> is what you get when you multiply a kilowatt, 1,000 joules per second times an hour, which is 3,600 seconds. Well, what happens to the seconds? They cancel out. And you really end up with an answer that's joules, which is why a kilowatt hour is equal to 3.6 times 10 to the sixth joules. That's a lot of energy. And you get charged by your electric company by how many kilowatt hours you use per month. Sorry, skipped too many there. <clears throat> all right, to apply this now, a couple problems. A circuit provides a maximum current of 20 amps. All right, there's your I value current. And an operating voltage of 1.2. This is just a fancy way of writing 120 volts, which is what we get out of our uh, electric sockets here in America. How many 75-watt bulbs can operate with this voltage source? All right. Well, so how much power are we getting? How much power is being generated <clears throat> if we have um, the maximum current is 20 amps, right? So there's power is equal to amps times volts. So 20 amps times 120 volts means 2.4 times 10 to the third watts, which is 2,400 watts, right? So that's how much power um, can be delivered by this electrical circuit. 
And so then we say, all right, well, if we can, if we have that much power, and each one of our bulbs uses 75 watts of power, then we simply do what's 2400 divided by 75. And that tells you how many bulbs you could use. Second question, uh, if you're being charged 12 cents per kilowatt hour, how much does it cost to operate these bulbs for eight hours? All right, well, so energy, right, is equal to power times time. And so we take the power that we've got, the 2400 watts, um, and we multiply it times one kilowatt hour per thousand watts, right? And that's simply a way of changing this uh, into kilowatt hours. And then we multiply times eight hours, right? So basically your cost is how many kilowatt hours you're using multiplied by 12 cents per kilowatt hour, right? It's not really uh, rocket science there, but you have to first know how many kilowatt hours have you used. Okay, go ahead and try this one. <laughs> Example three, an electric heater is operated by applying a potential difference of 50 volts to a nichrome wire of total resistance eight. All right, well, that should be eight ohms, all right? Resistance is measured in ohms. Find the current carried by the wire and the power rating of the heater. All right, so formula for current is equal to voltage divided by uh, resistance, all right? That comes from Ohm's law. That's just simply one of the three versions of Ohm's law solved for current. So you're simply taking the voltage, dividing by the resistance, and that gives you the current in amps. And then how much um, how much power is that going to use? All right. Well, power is equal to I squared R. Now remember, there's three formulas for power, so you have to look at what do you know? All right. We know the current here, and we know the resistance, so that that we can use the I squared R. Uh, version. So um, 6.25 amps squared times 8 ohms gives us 313 watts. Alrighty, and you can give this one a try. I believe that is the end of lesson two.